Well, welcome back. Uh, I'm the moderator of our last panel, which will focus on those specific areas for hydrogen deployment where Houston can potentially lead. Recently, the National Renewable Energy Lab released a study that showed that the total available market for hydrogen in the United States could potentially increase 10x uh, from 10 million tons to over 106 million tons per year. Importantly, the NREL study shows that Houston accounts for about 5% of that total demand and the state of Texas for about 10%. That's on par with California, which is today is viewed as the leading market for hydrogen. So we should have a bright future in creating new markets for hydrogen, but the question becomes, how will those markets evolve? While today hydrogen is used primarily as a feedstock in refining and petrochemicals, NREL saw growth in mobility, particularly for those markets such as trucks and delivery vehicles where weight, duty cycles, and filling times are key. Besides mobility, there is a significant push to decarbonize the largest uses of hydrogen today, industrial production, and perhaps new applications like steel, cement, and glass are all industries that will need hydrogen to decarbonize. In addition, there could be a role for hydrogen in solving very long duration energy storage and renewables intermittency. And perhaps as we've heard, Japan and Europe could become large import markets for hydrogen or ammonia made from hydrogen, given their large decarbonization goals and the inability to produce enough hydrogen domestically. And lastly, given hydrogen's high en energy density, aviation is increasingly considered a potential market both in airplanes and commercial drones. Given all of these potential uses, I'm pleased to have a great panel of experts to help us think about the future and determine what to do to create it. So I'd like to introduce my panel. Uh, first is Neva, uh, Neva uh, Espinoza, uh, Vice President of Energy Supply and Low Carbon Resources at the Electric Power Research Institute. Uh, Michael Lewis is Senior Engineering Scientist at the University of Texas. Uh, Brian Rapp is Vice President of Business Development at Texas Brine Company. Uh, Pradeep uh, Venkaraman is Senior Manager of Investment and Business Development of Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. Uh, Brian Weeks is Senior Director of Business Development at Gas Technology Institute. And finally, Katie Zimmerman is Business Development Manager, Energy Transition at the Woods Group. Thank all of you guys for joining us. So let's play the uh, game one more time and assume that it's 2030 and the United States is on its way uh, to meeting its goal of a 50% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions uh, from 2005 levels. And Houston is now the hydrogen capital of the world. So what did you see as the major inflection points that led Houston to becoming the hydrogen capital of the world? Uh, who wants to start? Brian, Brian Weeks, maybe you. Sure, thanks, Brent. And uh, first of all, let me just say uh, thanks to the uh, Center for Houston's Future and to uh, Chevron and all the other sponsors for hosting this very important three-day discussion. And um, I'm honored to be part of this and, and look forward to, to the discussion that we're going to have here. So to, to address your question, that what, what are the major inflection points to get us to where we are today? Um, I don't want to spend too much time talking about the history of hydrogen and how we got here, but really the, the, the thing that's really beginning to change is we're talking about hydrogen as an energy storage solution rather than uh, just as a niche transportation fuel or as a niche power fuel. And because we're looking at it as an energy storage solution, um, it, it lends itself to much, much larger scale. Uh, which then drives change, it drives uh, technology and it drives uh, costs lower as well. But there's a couple of other things I want to mention that since we're looking at 2030 and we're looking back, um, a couple of things that maybe haven't fully happened that need to happen is uh, looking at the energy system as, a, as an integrated energy system, not um, in different silos or just different, looking at supplies and specific applications, but looking at a more uh, integrated approach to energy that will help us uh, achieve decarbonization goals. And the last thing, which really needs to happen, and, and I see happening just, just people talk about it, but it's not, not um, where we need to be yet, is price transparency. Um, price transparency needs to happen so that we can unleash the financial guys to develop new products and services to give pricing certainty and, and, uh, um, uh, and help establish the demand and supply for hydrogen. 
I'll stop there and hopefully. Okay, great. Touch on some as, uh, as we go on. Neva, I might go to you because you uh, have a, a broad project looking at the future. Uh, do you have some thoughts on this? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, so I, I put some thought into kind of enablers that really make that difference that that shifts Houston there. And I came up with kind of four key things and we can explore what they are through the conversation today. But one is the adoption of an industrial cluster model, which Houston is already very strong on. I'm sure we're going to have a conversation around that throughout the day. The second is leveraging the, you know, the, the innovation that's currently already ongoing around Houston, I think is critical. The third is accepting, very openly accepting that hydrogen ha does not have to go directly to green, right? Going blue can make a huge impact and then you can build from there as you see fit. And then the fourth is a very intentional focus on retaining leadership. Right, Houston can potentially be considered an incumbent in this space, right? You're already very, very strong in much of this production. You're already very strong in the industrial space. So that change through decarbonization is a very, very hard one. So having a clear focus on retaining that leadership, I think helps you get there as well. So those are my four, my four points. Okay, good, very clear. Uh, Michael, how about you? Any thoughts on this, on this question? Well, sure. Um, I guess, you know, first of all, the question was Houston, a leader, you know, Houston being a leader in hydrogen in the world, they might already be right from a lot of what I heard already today. Um, so how do they continue to be a leader might be more important or uh, and so forth. I think uh, we kind of are maybe at that inflection point right now. A lot of pieces of the puzzle are coming together. Um, as you're well aware, Brett, and maybe a lot of people on the call and some of the people on this panel with me, we we have a, a DOE sponsor H2 at scale demonstration project for Texas. Uh, that's going to include a large focus on the port of Houston and what can be done in the area. Uh, but when we pulled that project together, there wasn't a lot of buzz about hydrogen in Texas. Uh, ever since that award, things have just exploded and taken off. Um, you know, is it coincidence? Is it not? It, it likely is not. I think there are a lot of other driving factors other than our award. Um, but but also when I think about this question, what might have been the inflection point that changed things for Texas or Houston and hydrogen? And I keep kind of coming back to trying to draw a parallel and I don't know exactly how, how much of this applies, but thinking about what happened with wind power in West Texas, renewable wind power, right? How that exploded and took off in you know, late 90s, early 2000s, uh, the, the CREZ initiative and everything, they got the transmission lines in place. And I'm, you know, there were a lot of aspects of that, you know, stars were aligning, right? The technology was there. You know, people saw this opportunity for growth in jobs and new markets. Um, and I think all those stars are starting to align for, for, for hydrogen right now. And maybe a similar policy, right? That's probably the one thing lacking uh, in a lot of discussions, um, you know, why hydrogen in Texas and Houston. But maybe a similar parallel policy is what the inflection point is that really kicks it off and you know, maybe at least new infrastructure, uh, whether it's pipelines or new production facilities. But that's kind of what I'm thinking, you know, might be that that inflection point that, you know, when we're, you know, 10 years from now, that might have changed everything. Good. Okay, I'm gonna go to the other Brian, Brian Rapp. Brian, you work for a um, an interesting company that does a lot of underground storage. So uh, you're a new player to this game. Talk about what you think uh, the inflection points might be to create this new industry. Sure. Uh, first off, thanks for having me. I think this is this is very exciting. Uh, a year or two ago, we weren't talking about hydrogen at all. It was all natural gas and other products. And uh, now this is uh, obviously a, a very big, very important topic that we're all really, really excited about. Um, I think uh, Houston in particular, we've got uh, a kind of a unique blend of resources that's really unmatched anywhere in the country and maybe in the world. We've got the uh, the infrastructure already there from a natural gas standpoint. We've got uh, the pipeline infrastructure. We've got the, the users. We've got the demand for both natural gas and hydrogen. We've got the port that we've talked about. And uh, from my standpoint, we've got a, a, a unique geological uh, formation in a lot of areas underground in southeast Texas, where we where we uh, have these underground salt domes that we already store a, a, an enormous amount of natural gas and. Uh, and other hydrocarbons underground. And uh, 
have an opportunity to uh, to store even more hydrogen than we are today. I think it was mentioned in a, a previous session that we uh, that in Southeast Texas, uh, the three uh, hydrogen storage caverns in the uh, in the whole country are located in our region. So it's already a, a proven um, uh, integral part to the hydrogen infrastructure today. Uh, we've got plenty of opportunities to expand on that. Uh, both through uh, initially blending uh, hydrogen into natural gas uh, pipelines and underground caverns and uh, and down the road uh, converting and developing new caverns and pipelines for uh, for gaseous hydrogen so uh, we're really excited about it um, you know we, we think that uh, that energy storage is going to be key to our future um, we have an opportunity to take the power that we get from sun and wind and uh, store it long-term underground as hydrogen and use it to create more power when needed. And uh, you know, we're, uh, we're just uh, looking forward to the opportunity to participate in this, uh, this infrastructure. Uh, Pradeep, I might go to you next because I know that Mitsubishi has been a, a big player in this uh, game already. And so uh, tell us what you think some of the inflection points are. What do you see out there in terms of making this uh, all happen? So thank you very much for having me on, on this panel. Uh, and I appreciate all our sponsors and, and Central Houston for, for organizing this. Um, I want to start out of, start with a joke actually that I was just telling the others before we started off is, uh, and I'm going to steal from a former Undersecretary General uh, at an Oxford Union that uh, pretty much feel like the last wife of uh, Henry VIII. Uh, you know, you know what is expected of you, but you don't know how to do it any better than people who came before you. So this point has been uh, mentioned several times, but um, uh, I, I'll try to put some perspective uh, in terms of numbers as, you know, as of today, uh, you know, 2019, uh, as of 2020, 2021, 50% uh, of the global, uh, you know, U.S. hydrogen production is coming from uh, from Houston uh, or the U.S. Gulf Coast. And so we have the technology know-how, we have the experience, um, and uh, we have, uh, you know, the resources to build on this. The inflection point in terms of this, I think one of the things that Brian uh, Weeks already brought up is, is the integration of uh, energy systems. Uh, that is one of the major inflection points that would happen. Uh, one of the sectors that, that, is, that doesn't get talked about much in terms of uh, hydrogen usage is, is the aviation sector. So if you look at Houston itself, uh, you know, it's a big hub for United and United in April committed for, uh, towards um, sustainability. And a lot of sustainable aviation fuel, hydrogen is going to be an input for sustainable aviation fuel. In fact, Mitsubishi has MHIA has invested in companies uh, to, that produce uh, sustainable aviation fuel um, and, and, and diesel too. So, so hydrogen in some form is going to be part of the energy mixture, if not directly. Uh, the other things are definitely, uh, you know, we have the one of the biggest ports uh, and, uh, you know, some, somewhere along the lines of, of Port of LA, uh, you know, Port of Houston decides half of its uh, drage uh, trucks so this is hypothetical. I'm in 2030, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking, you know, thinking backwards. Half of the fleet goes uh, hydrogen. Uh, you know, that's uh, that's that's you know the, the overcoming a certain uh, utilization uh, threshold, um, establishing uh, ourselves as you know the the hydrogen producers as well as users not only in the industrial sector, but also in other sectors like transportation. Um, and already in power generation, uh, I think uh, there are several projects that MHIA has, uh, uh, is doing world, uh, worldwide. The one other point I wanted to uh, bring up is most of the companies that are along the U.S. Gulf Coast have a large global footprint. And so, um, you know, we, we are involved in projects around the world and you know, learning by doing and bringing that learning, we can actually accelerate. So the inflection might have already happened uh, in terms of uh, you know, uh, getting started. Um, how it accelerates uh, remains to be seen. Great. Thanks. So, so Katie, I know you've been thinking a lot about this and we've heard a lot of different um, perspectives. How would you summarize all this? G give me uh, your perspective on this. Well, I'll piggyback off of what Neva said. I know Anybody that's talked to me about this before has heard me joke about we need to rebrand ourselves as H2 Town. <laughs> but 
really like the concept of an industrial cluster where we focus on lower carbon hydrogen, not getting hung up on, is it blue, is it green? Look at our existing infrastructure, see what can we reuse, what makes sense, and then what should we build new? We have 48 SMRs. We've talked about that a few times during the conference, but some of them are really old and don't really lend themselves to carbon capture. Others, it's low hanging fruit that we should explore and we kind of should wonder why aren't we already doing it, right? And part of what I think goes with it is when you talk about hydrogen and going from gray to blue, CCUS automatically comes in and that's the industrial clusters. And so like Dr. Friedman talking about net zero T side, Humber zero, a lot of these are projects that Wood's done the engineering for. So we can say we've looked at the scale and our CCUS expert, she always tells me, she's like, you know, if you took every point source in the UK and you gathered it together, you get 140 million tons per annum of CO2 per year. Houston, we just take our top 50 emitters and we have 100 million tons per annum. So we're just scratching the surface. And I think we just really need to push for it's bigger, it's better, it's a very Texas sized project and we need to use our innovation. We did the shale revolution and this to me is the next step in decarbonization. Well, good. Well, thanks for summarizing that. It's really interesting. I think the bigger and better and bolder, I think that's one of the themes that's certainly coming out of this discussion. Um, I want to go back to what Pradeep talked about because uh, he, he sort of paint, painted this vision in, in aviation and um, in transportation, maybe 50% of the trucks you know, just say in 2030 have now gone uh, to hydrogen as, as their fuel and, and aviation is another potential markets. Um, so let's talk about this. What what are the primary roles that you see hydrogen fulfilling, u uniquely fulfilling in 2030? I think one of the other panelists mentioned that if we were at a battery conference, um, people would be saying the batteries would be fulfilling all these um, you know, all these, um, uh, you know, the, these roles. So where, where do we really see, uh, if we think about it, um, you know, um, you know, uh, in a very crisp way, where do we see uh, hydrogen uh, playing a role? Uh, Mike, maybe you could start us off on this because uh, I think you were the one who had the comment about, um, you know, the battery guys, for example. <laughs> uh, yeah, ba batteries do have their role uh, and, and we should all thank batteries because they help out in a lot of fuel cell related applications as well, right? Especially when it comes to transportation, those, those people still have batteries in them. Um, but I think uh, I, I would go back to kind of what Brian said early on about energy storage, right? Uh, seeing hydrogen as a form of energy storage, I think that's kind of the role it can uniquely fill. But, you know, beyond what batteries can do, of course, right? Large scale energy storage, seasonal energy storage. You know, we, uh, on our current project, we looked at, you know, where, uh, how hydrogen might fit in in the operations of a data center and realize real quickly that you know, that's seasonal storage that's needed there, um, relatively large amounts of it, not you know daily storage where batteries might excel. Um, but yeah, uh, I think the power sector though, especially right now in Texas might, might present a unique opportunity, right? So we're using hydrogen as energy storage for renewables, uh, but then you're if you think about the electrolyzer assets, the fuel cell assets that might fit into that power grid, uh, suddenly those become somewhat dispatchable uh, so you can quickly adjust your load or sources or so forth. Uh, and, and the political environment might be right for that right now. Uh, it could be potentially something that, you know, could get people behind expanding hydrogen infrastructure in Texas in the future. Uh, but that's where I go, go, go uh, the energy storage route and it can be used, you know, whatever, transportation, making power. Okay, so, so so maybe go to Brian Rapp. You have a bunch of those storage caverns. Uh, you know, tell me about a little bit about energy storage and how do you see that working, uh, in, perhaps in Texas? Yeah, you know, I think after uh, after what we went through in February, we all wish we we had more energy storage underground. Um, uh, you know, we we do have a lot of natural gas stored underground, and we're able to put a lot of that to, to good use, and uh, and that helped things not get even worse than they already were, but. Uh, I think we have a, a great opportunity to, to put a lot of carbon-free energy into the ground. Uh, uh, I hate to see wind turbines being idle just because the demand is low. If we could keep them running and, and uh, make that energy into hydrogen and store that until it's needed and uh, put it to good use when the demand is there, it'll help out with the pricing, it'll help out with the supply. 
and uh, and you can do it in a uh, in a carbon free manner that uh, that kind of help us get to where we all want to get to by by uh, you know 2030 and beyond. So uh, that that's kind of what I'm looking at, and I think that you know from a, a transportation standpoint, it, it's hard to envision it it you know taking over you know what we're already seeing from a uh, electric powered uh, you know cars and trucks that are out there, but I think really on bigger vehicles. Uh, planes, uh, ships, uh, you know, cargo vessels, buses, things like that. A lot of the things that are uh, using uh, diesel or even compressed natural gas today, I think those are some probably the uh, bigger opportunities. Hydrogen's already being used in a lot of fork trucks and shuttles and things like that. And uh, and I think, you know, there's a, a really big opportunity to expand on that and, and get a, a carbon-free carbon -free, uh, fuel source into uh, into some of our, uh, our bigger vessels, yeah. Okay, good. Uh, so I'm going to go to our um, our two think tanks, um, EPRI and GTI, and maybe ask um, your perspectives. I know you have the Low Carbon Resource Initiative, a large project to think about um, these roles of uh, hydrogen. Um, so Neva, maybe um, give us your perspective from EPRI, and then I'll ask Brian to give uh, his perspective from GTI. Absolutely, thank you. So yeah, so as you mentioned, with the Low Carbon Resources Initiative, which is a, a partnership between EPRI and GTI that's really looking at how do you enable economy-wide decarbonization utilizing hydrogen, ammonia, synthetic fuel, biofuels. So I think, first of all, when you think about um, what is the role of hydrogen and where should it where, where should it fill its role, it's not just hydrogen, right? It's hydrogen and all the derivative products of hydrogen. So I know that's kind of semantics, but that's important because not all applications are going to use hydrogen in a pure form. Some may be blended, some may be some other fuel that comes from hydrogen. So, so that's, that's first of all. Second of all, I think it's really important to make sure we're looking across the entire economy to see where can we be most impactful. So to me, it's the hard to abate sectors, right? There are sectors like transportation, not heavy duty transportation, but light and some medium duty heavy transportation that, that are gonna be electrified, right? And that's okay. There's gonna be a lot of the economy that electrification is the right solution, but that alone cannot do it. Batteries, of course, cannot do it alone, right? So we need to be looking at the sectors that do not have a clear pathway otherwise to decarbonize. So those would include things like steel, aluminum, fertilizers, petrochemicals, heavy duty manufacturing, anything with hybrid heating. Um, all of those are probably good options in terms of low carbon fuels as we move forward. Um, will there be a role in power, in power generation? I believe there will be, but I, I believe that that is more of a last carbon mile, right? I think there are other pathways that can enable you, enable you to decarbonize the electric sector right now and then utilize that sector to decarbonize other sectors of the economy. Um, and the last piece I would say is resilience, right? Um, Brian, I don't know if it's you or, or Michael who talked about what happened in February, obviously resilience became a very big part of the conversation, but this is not technologies fighting technologies. There is room for all of the technologies. There is more than enough room for all of these technologies. And we need an abundance of those technologies on the table as part of the portfolio as we move forward. So those are some of my thoughts. Okay, that's great. Um, maybe I'll go to Brian Weeks next uh, from GTI's perspective. Uh, how, how do you see this playing out? You know, it, it, everything Neva said, um, I'm in total agreement. But, but let me um, sort of step back. When we talk about it, it, we mentioned before the integrated energy system aspect yep. of all this. And when we look at what it takes to grow market, to, to, to transition our energy sector, supply and demand don't typically grow in tandem, in step, in lockstep with one another. So, uh, for example, um, it, it, let me just give you a, a very simple example. We've done a number of projects on the West Coast and in California involving hydrogen deployment for specific applications. And every time we, we do a project, and, and these have been very important for advancing the technology. Level, but every time we do a project, we have to identify a discrete supply um, of hydrogen to support new truck um, de deployments. We're currently working on a hydrogen locomotive uh, project uh, in, in the Sacramento area. But you always have to identify a, a discrete hydrogen supply to go with that to support that particular project. In Houston, we have an opportunity to leverage existing infrastructure that 
we can draw upon hydrogen supplies because it is already an integrated system that we can build upon, expand upon, uh, might perhaps repurpose in some ways. But this is a sort of a, a simple sort of elementary example of, of, of what we're talking about when we talk about an integrated energy system, being able to use and redirect a commodity such as hydrogen, a very important uh, new fuel for different applications without having to recreate infrastructure every time we need to add a particular, uh, uh, serve a particular customer. So we, we, I'll talk some more about that in, as we move forward, but um, that's where I see a lot of, you know, the role of hydrogen, hydrogen's a common denominator in a lot of these different applications. Neva mentioned uh, all, all the diff these different applications where hydrogen can play a role, um, but those same role, those same applications can be served by other fuels. So hydrogen, as we grow that market, can begin to enter again if we're looking at this from an integrated perspective. So, good, uh, Pradeep. Perfect, Pradeep. You started this discussion about integrating these systems. I think some people call this sector coupling. So, so paint me a picture uh, from your perspective on how this might play out, and what are some of the applications you might see um, uh, evolving. I'm I'm still in 2030 right now, but I want to put some uh, uh, Absolutely. perspective on the GHG emission data, right? So we're talking about uh, reducing GHG emissions. So in uh, if you compare 2005 and 2000 uh, uh, to 2030, uh, if you see different sectors as of 2019, so I'm looking from looking at the EPA data, and 77% uh, of the GHG emissions are coming from uh, transportation. Uh, industry, uh, in, industrial sector, and, uh, and the third one is the uh, power generation, right? But if you look at how much it has reduced over uh, from 2005 to 2030, uh, the, the power sector has actually reduced 33% of GHG emissions over this period of time, whereas transportation has done 5% and industry has done 1%. And the, the goal is to get 50% get 50 of total emissions by, by 2030. So if you think about that, the key sectors then you start thinking about is, is industrial uh, and then uh, uh, and transportation. Now, if you look at hydrogen's unique uh, uh, applications, I think it will still play an important role in power because a lot of decarbonization in the power has happened because of the renewables. And, uh, and what, uh, what we see as um, Mitsubishi is, is the balancing of the, the renewables uh, that, that hydrogen will play, play a role. Um, it, but but in, the, in, in the direct application, I think industrial decarbonization um, and hard to uh, uh, you know decarbonize role as, as Neva pointed out is where hydrogen will key, uh, play unique roles hydrogen directly or in its some form of its uh, you know derivative like ammonia or uh, hydrogen derived uh, methanol or something like that but you would always uh, you know hydrogen will have a play uh, in, in sustainable aviation fuel uh, in in marine uh, marine fuel as well as um, you know a large portion of industrial decarbonization the uh, steel industry or steam industry i think uh, it's going to come from uh, from hydrogen so that those are what i uh, see as a unique roles of hydrogen uh, to be specific. Okay, very. That's very helpful. And uh, and Katie, how about you? Uh, where do you see this? And and maybe if you could focus on this idea of derivatives, we haven't really talked that much about that. If you have a perspective on that, that may be something to add to the mix. Well, what I've been thinking about this whole time is, you know, we made the mention of Fury and how we were all sitting in the cold for a while in Houston even though our grid is isolated in an island, the hydrogen infrastructure, the natural gas infrastructure is not. So I know there was like the Warren Buffett offer if he could come in and make a new power plant. And then I know I heard some people kind of talk about, well, does it have to be natural gas? Could it be hydrogen? So what cool things can we do in Houston? What can we experiment with? And then kind of take advantage of the fact that we do have this awesome infrastructure that we could expand and build. And then we also have world-class refining petrochemicals and they're all big, heavy hydrogen users. So we can make a huge impact to Bernice's earlier point on decreasing industrial emissions 
by focusing, I'll sound like Chuck McConnell, but focus on the emissions. <laughs> you know, everybody is kind of saying we need to look at where can we make that impact? How can we do it? And if we're in 2030 saying we've come so far, I think we did that by looking at what are the bits of low hanging fruit and then how do we roll it out as fast as we can? Cool. So sorry if I didn't get to derivatives. No, that's okay. We'll get back to it. But that's really good. So um, we'll let Warren know that he has a new competitor and hydrogen as the uh, backup fuel. That'll be interesting. That is a bit. That would be an, uh, a big, hairy, audacious goal to pull that off. That would be uh, something we might think about a little bit more. Um, but let's think about this idea of sector coupling or clusters or whatever we want to call it, um, where everything sort of works together. And we've had a couple different times where we've we sort of painted these pictures of what a hydrogen cluster might look like. Um, so, you know, let's think about this in 2030. You know, Andy had a picture of it. I think I had a picture. Uh, just give me your picture, Mike. What does is, what is a hydrogen cluster in Houston look like in 2030? Um, yeah, it's probably a lot like it looks today, right? We have, <laughs> Houston already has a lot of the pieces uh, in place, right? Production distribution. I think in 2030, though, there's going to be carbon capture associated with it, right? Uh, maybe there's more green renewable hydrogen, whether that's from wind power, solar, or, or what have you, or maybe new newer technologies out there, um, like we heard about on the on the previous panel. Uh, so I think that would be the big difference. Um, and then beyond clusters, you know, um, I, I, I keep coming back to export for Houston as well, which we can talk about later, but you might actually be getting out of that cluster of Houston and servicing clusters around the globe. So. Okay, cool. So, so let's talk about that. I mean, do we see Houston as a, um, a cluster for electrolysis, for example? Uh, Brian, uh, Neva, any, any thoughts on that or other parts of the cluster? Uh, what, is, what does this look like? Give me a picture of what it looks like so I can, this can be a little bit more concrete. Neva, you want to go first? Um, Oh, Brian, uh, Neva, go first. Oh, Brian, you go first. I went last time. You go. You go. Okay, oh, okay. Brian, then Neva. Um, just, you know, typically when we, when we think about clusters, we think of, or, or hubs, let's call it a hub, is because I know hub, hydrogen hubs are very much in the news right now. And we think of, we think of the physical attributes, um, storage, um, end use, um, supply, um, and distribution infrastructure all being... Uh, co-located or located in a, in, a, in a way to easily grow the market. But, but in Houston, in addition to that, we have all those things in Houston, but in addition to that, and, and I think are very important and, and sometimes overlooked in the conversation, is workforce. We have a skilled workforce in the energy sector that's accustomed to working with high pressure gases with, in hazardous, uh, to, to make hazardous situations safe by, by their trained work practices and so on. We have an investment community uh, that's look, that, that knows what to look for in investing in energy infrastructure. And uh, the business community, which has a global reach, um, something again we don't talk about is probably as much as we should is the global reach of the Houston community. Houston is one of the most international cities, if not the most international city in the US. Uh, we don't talk about that a lot. We, and that gives us a, a global reach that, again, I think is, is one of the attributes that would make th this area, um, and I speak as a, as, a, as a Houstonian, I've lived here for 40 years, um, that you know, really can, can, can be an energy transition, an energy cluster for the new transition in energy. Cool. Neva. Neva. Yeah, so uh, I agree with everything Brian said. I think that's fantastic. I think your workforce is, is uh, a huge asset to what, to what you have there in Houston. But I think there's something that we're kind of losing sight of a little bit maybe in the context. Houston already is a hydrogen hub, right? You guys, I mean, a ton of hydrogen comes out of Houston. You're dedicated pipeline. You have a, a ton of hydrogen producers there. You're not trying to be a hydrogen hub. You're trying to be a net zero hub a net zero cluster. And the net zero is really where that comes in. I mean, almost everybody I, I talk to about hydrogen says to me, well, how much am I gonna need? How, how much needs to be produced? What's the demand gonna be? Well, the magic about industrial clusters, which are not a new idea at all, because 
Houston is an industrial cluster, but the, the magic about industrial clusters is you solve that problem from the beginning. Now in Houston, you may oversupply and then you're a net exporter, which is, which is great because the world needs that. But having that common goal from the beginning and creating a pathway across the value chain to hit the net zero hydrogen hub is what can make you unique and the scale is, is is the other piece that makes you unique as katie mentioned before we see hydrogen hubs or industrial clusters popping up all over the world right um humber is a great example of one if you haven't looked it up go and google it there's amazing things going on there but houston can be so large and impactful so quickly and it's really greening i say greening i don't mean greening i mean i probably mean blueing but decarbonizing the supply you have and then building on top of that so I think that's something that we just can't lose, lose sight of. Okay, no, fair point. I think that's a great point that we need to talk about this. We are already a hub that, that what we're really talking about is a net zero hub. And I wanna, I wanna pick up on that last point that you made and go a little bit off script and maybe just ask you guys. Uh, you talked about you know accepting that hydrogen doesn't have to be all green, that it can be these different shades. And we've talked about carbon intensity. Does someone have a perspective on that? How, what should this look like in, in, in 2030? What's sort of the mix? Uh, of technologies? Does anyone, uh, you know, we've talked about different technologies, these up and coming technologies like uh, Syzygy has. What, what does this look like from a, a technology standpoint? Do, do all these things have a, uh, a place in the uh, ecosystem here? Uh, Pradeep, I thought you were raising your hand there. I think you are touched, you are, you are, you've brought up a very uh, point that I'm, I'm very touchy about is the color washing. And uh, earlier this week, I was listening into uh, the Hydrogen Council, uh, head of the Hydrogen Council speak. And he, uh, he mentioned that the, the colors are for kindergarten uh, and the numbers are for high school. Uh, and so I, I want to use that analogy. And as we go towards 2030, uh, we are going to move away from the color uh, and more towards uh, a hydrogen certification of, uh, uh, you know, on based on uh, carbon intensity. Because once the molecule is in the pipeline, it doesn't have a color, right? So um, essentially, uh, you, you would have some sort of a, uh, an, one point that we missed in all this conversation is you see a lot of uh, 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 technology companies moving from California to Texas. That's going to add to the benefit of this energy transition because we, we now have a te technology revolution in terms of blockchain. You know, that's going to help um, you know, make the hydrogen hub even, you know, uh, better in terms of how you certify this, how you, you know, uh, transport hydrogen, how you keep track of the carbon intensity. Um, so I don't know if I'm, uh, if I'm making my point across, but uh, the, 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 the point is at some point of time in 2030, at least we will not be talking about the colors. We'll be talking about carbon intensity and we'll be talking about um, how we, uh, you know, using blockchain technology, how would be changing, uh, you know, trading hydrogen, um, either exporting or consuming, um, along with carbon dioxide to, to Katie's point, yes. You know, it's a, it's a really good point because I think uh, this point has been made a couple different times, and I don't think we've picked it up before the conference is this idea of markets. And I know that maybe I'll go to Mike Lewis on this. Uh, you guys are working on creating a model of markets. So how do you see this, you know, the market evolving for, for hydrogen? Maybe that'd be something to just to think about for a second. Well, um, at least getting into, you know, the aspect of the carbon intensity of it, right, or the colors, what kind we want to frame that. Um, you know, I think Neva's point was well made, right? It's got to be kind of this, you know, low carbon uh, in the future because there are many markets where, you know, that we talk about where hydrogen could play a role, uh, but it doesn't make sense <laughs> if it's not low carbon hydrogen, right? Uh, you know, putting SMR, traditional SMR hydrogen back into a gas turbine, you're just, you know, there's no point in that, right? So it has to be low, low carbon hydrogen for that. Uh, yeah, how do these markets evolve? You know, there, there are some near-term opportunities in transportation where things make a lot of sense. Um, you know, but can, but can transportation make that lift all its own for low CI hy hydrogen in and around the port area, right? Do other markets have to come along with that uh, power or, or, or other industrial markets? Maybe it's marine. Um, those are things we're, we're, we're trying to uh, take a look at with, with our study right now to, to see how that plays out. So, Katie, I'll go to you now. Um, you know, how do you see um, this idea of, um, you know, markets evolving, 
Um, is this something that uh, you've given any thought to in terms of wh where Houston might go in terms of uh, uh, starting to develop some of these, um, uh, uh, the assets that we have? Yes, I think what I really see going forward is we're talking about being able to make that lower carbon hydrogen. And if we can do it for cheaper than a lot of other global markets, we talked earlier today about Rotterdam, Germany, Japan, a lot of international markets have plans to import. So if Houston can be the net exporter, like we are for so many other things of this lower carbon hydrogen, I think it can produce a lot of jobs, keep the workforce here, all things that are in line with our regional goals and objectives. Okay. So um, let's move on. You know, we've already talked about, and I think it's become clear that we have lots of the assets here. We are the hub today. The question is, how do we get uh, to net zero? Um, you know, Houston, so the real question is, and we heard from one of the other panels is, you know, what, how could we screw this up? What, what, might, what might we do wrong that would um, sort of take this favored position that we have? And if we look back in 2030 and say, wow, we, we just didn't get there. What, what would be the things that we ought to be worried about? Uh, what are the threats um, to Houston becoming the, the zero carbon uh, hub? Uh, who wants to start that? Um, maybe Brian, Brian Weeks, do you have a perspective sure. on that? Um, my good friend Trevor Best in the previous uh, panel um, asked the group a question and I'm gonna ask the group another question. Is, is, our, is our goal green hydrogen or is our goal decarbonization? So if we, if we get lost in the um, search for the perfect, um, we're gonna overlook the good and the improved. I mean, this, this, we see this over and over in other applications. So that, that would be one way to get off the, the, the path. I mean, let's face it, there is a, there is a um, distrust for the established energy industry amongst a, a big part of the, the population. And a lot of people view um, our argument that using and leveraging existing infrastructure is merely a ploy to perpetuate a, a fossil fuel um, economy. Well, it's a means to achieve a, a, this decarbonization goal that many of us in the industry realize this is the best, most efficient, most dependable pathway that we can be on. And without the resources of the existing infrastructure and energy players, we're not gonna get there because those are the companies, those are the, those are the uh, infrastructure owners that have the expertise and the resources to help us achieve our overall goals. So we really screw it up if we discard that uh, and try and rebuild from scratch. Uh, Mike Lewis, any, any perspectives on how could we screw this up? How do we, what would be the things that we ought to be worried about that might, um, um, you know, stop us along this journey. Sure. Yeah. You know, this I, hydrogen, it's a big opportunity for you, sir, right now. And really you have, you know, only to lose if you don't, get, if you don't get it right. Right. If you screw this up, uh, um, it's like the Atlanta Falcons in the Super Bowl, right. You know, just <laughs> blowing a, a huge unheard of lead. Um, but, but, but I guess it could happen if, if Houston does not take the steps to, you know, provide, you know, to decarbonize hydrogen or provide a low, low CI version of hydrogen, whether it's purely green or blue, many of the markets, you know, internationally or even domestically are, are wanting the low CI hydrogen for, you know, various reasons. Um, and, you know, like right here in Texas, just down the coast, you know, thinking about you know, are, you know, is Houston going to lead? Or are they going to fall behind here? Um, you know, the Port of Corpus Christi, your kind of competitor just down the coast uh, recently had an MOU where they're putting in a green electrolyzer facility, uh, producing like nine metric tons of hydrogen, uh, I guess, per year with that. Uh, it's going to feed off, you know, it's going to run off solar. They're going to have a battery facility with it as well. Uh, but, you know, now is the time for Houston to start taking such, such actions, whether it's carbon capture or, you know, even green electro, electro, electrolysis. I think uh, Houston only has to lose here, right? Um, they are, they have the lead. They need to continue. Okay. So 
<clears throat> so I guess a little bit of a threat from down the coast that, that ought to get things going at the port. That'll be uh, interesting to hear uh, when we take that back. Um, I'm going to go to maybe Brian Rapp. So you, you um, are relatively new to this. Uh, you know, as you started to think about this market, what attracted you, um, your company to get involved? And you might talk a little bit about the company just as a family owned business and, uh, and uh, you know, and, and, and think about how you think about taking the assets that you have and, and moving them into new markets. So uh, just real quick, you know, we are a family owned business where we just five years old this year. Um, so the families. Oops, I think we're losing you there. And, and, uh, and storing products on the ground for a long time. We uh, were the biggest supplier, Brian, in the country. We supply a lot of foreign producers. It's another benefit to this area is there are a lot of uh, foreign producers around here, which gives us an opportunity to develop a lot of underground storage volume, which can be used for uh, storing a variety of products, including hydrogen. Uh, you know, we've kicked around hydrogen before and other alternative products, compressed air, helium, things like that. Uh, but just over the past, like, you know, year, 18 months, it's really, really gotten a lot of steam behind it. And, uh, and you know, we've got an opportunity to take our assets to them to good use to help out the hydrogen infrastructure that we're going to need to, to provide the, the storage for, uh, for all of this to work. I think, uh, I think you know, Houston's, Houston's gotten an advantage over other areas of the country. This is being looked at all over the country and all over the world, as you know. But uh, but in Houston, from a hydrogen storage standpoint, you know we've got a tremendous amount of volume. There's other areas of the country where the salt's too deep, or it's not as thick, or it's not there at all. Um, so you know we've got to look at other options for storage. We don't have those problems here, so I think uh, we will take advantage of it. It's just we should be we should continue to lead. We should we've been the energy leaders. We should. Uh, continue to be the energy leader. I don't think we're going to, Texas as a state is going to be quite as progressive as states like California and New York and trying to decarbonize everything, including power production as quickly, but, you know, we don't want to lag behind those states. We want to take advantage of the, uh, of the opportunities that we have and the, uh, the unique advantages we have and, uh, and not, I fully expect by 2030 that we'll, uh, we'll be, you know, well situated to continue to lead and with this hydrogen infrastructure. Well, you know, uh, that's interesting. You, you mentioned that other places are, are working on this and this is becoming a global market. Uh, maybe I'll ask Neva uh, to comment on that. I mean, who, who uh, should Houston be worried about? Uh, who are, um, you know, our global competitors? And then also, are, you know, maybe this is a co-opetition thing. Who are our collaborators? How should we be thinking about organizing this as an industry? Absolutely. So, you know, I come from the Electric Power Research Institute. We are in the business of collaboration, people. So, I mean, in all reality, we want to achieve a 50% economy-wide CO2 reduction in the next 10 years. That is three times as fast as what we've done over the past 15 years. You can't be looking at people as competitors. You have to be collaborating. Right? We have to make sure we're not duplicating efforts. We have to make sure we're learning from each other. We have to make sure we're doing that right now. There is not time to fight. There's not time for fighting. There is time for working together and getting there together. So I, I don't think you have true competitors. I think if we're not learning from each other, we're going to fall behind. Uh, Pradeep, any, any thoughts on that as well? Yeah, I, I agree with Neva. Uh, I, think, I think our competitor is time. Uh, we are competing against time to meet this. Uh, and um, I think I brought this point up before that most of the companies here have a large global footprint. Um, and we are going to learn from you know, our experiences elsewhere. Uh, for example, Mitsubishi has a bunch of hydrogen projects around the globe and uh, those learnings can be leveraged. And, uh, and to answer the previous question on threat, I think we are actually going to leverage that and you know, go from step A to step C instead of you know, going to step B because the, uh, we're going to learn from our, uh, uh, from our experiences elsewhere. So um, I think it's going to be a collaboration. You can see a lot of that happening already. Uh, you know, Mitsubishi and Texas Prime. Uh, you can see the, the DOE project uh, uh, that Mike is, uh, is leading and GTI is leading. So Brian and Mike, um, uh, you know, all of us on this call and most, 
most of us are collaborating right now uh, in some form or the other. Uh, and so I think that the partnership, uh, not just industry-led uh, partnership, but also uh, you know, invest strategic investments in, in startups, as well as um, you know, uh, uh, collaboration between uh, uh, academia and, and industries. Um, are, are we are going to see a lot of that hope happening over the uh, over the decade, and that's that's the way forward. Very good. Uh, and and uh, Brian Weeks, you uh, GTI have a similar uh, a model. So let's talk about this idea of learning and collaboration and how we leverage learning. What what do you guys see from a GTI standpoint? Well, let me just build on what what both Neva and and Pradeep have just said. Um, well, uh, Neva referred to this earlier in her comments, but this uh, we have a low carbon resources initiative that EPRI and GTI are leading. This is every major gas and electric utility in North America and increasingly internationally is, have come together to try and map out a low carbon pathway for, um, for the entire country. And it's, it's a collaboration like nothing I've ever seen in the energy industry. Uh, we, um, I, I, I mentioned this because we, we would like to include even more companies that, that are represented here in this group, but or in this in this uh, conference, um, contact Neva or myself. But um, this is a, an example of collaboration. Another great example of collaboration is the work we're doing uh, in partnership with University of Texas, uh, Mike, and we're focusing specifically on the Houston area as a um, hydrogen hub, as a hydrogen uh, cluster, if you will. And this is a DOE-sponsored uh, project. These are the types of, and, and we have 15 companies uh, who are in the Houston area or have business here that are, that are part of this project. These are the types of collaboration that we're going to need. Things that can trip us up um, in Houston in particular is you know, we need to attract more innovative emerging technology companies. Um, you, you had Trevor and Syzygy on the last uh, panel. That's an example of the kinds of companies we need more of those kinds of companies uh, to, 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 to think that Houston is the place to go um, instead of other places uh, that I won't mention. We need more, okay, I come from an R&D organization, a research organization. We need more research. Research leads to products. Products lead to companies. Companies lead to more economic development. Um, these are things we don't have as much as we should in, in the Houston area. So we, um, I think those are some focus areas that, uh, that we can improve upon. Okay, well, you're leading into my next question, which is uh, what needs to happen? I think you guys have started to develop a pretty good list for me. I, I definitely heard collaboration and I heard that's going on uh, with some of the work that's being done uh, with UT and certainly we've been part of that work as well in, at GTI and EPRI. Uh, I heard uh, more startups. I heard um, we need to learn lessons from other parts of the globe, that there's a lot that we can build on. Uh, I heard um, about, about research. What are some of the other things that people see uh, that need to happen to start to capture some of these opportunities? Who'd like to get in on that one? Katie, I haven't, uh, uh, I'll give you a chance to maybe chime in and then uh, Pradeep. I'm so glad I have a strong opinion on this one. Um, as an oil and gas engineer who got my degree from UT, um, I will say what I think we need is a big banner project that everyone can get excited about that makes young people say, that's why I wanna do engineering. That's an awesome project. I wanna live in Houston and I wanna work on a project just like that. Um, I think Daniel, from Chevron Crack the Joke earlier, he came for one year, stayed for 20 and counting. My parents moved here way back in the 80s and they joke for their two year assignment that's still going. So I think the trick is to get people here for those fun, exciting projects. And then they see what a great place it is and they stay. And so if we can make that happen over and over and over again, focus on decarbonization, kind of back to your earlier question, don't get siloed. Remember, collaboration is really what we're all behind, and that's how we're going to win and not get stuck behind corpus or something that, you know, a Houstonian would be very offended by. So. 
Great. Pretty. Uh, Katie, just real quick, I probably get contacted weekly about our H2 at scale project by UT students wanting to become a part of it. So mm -hmm. you know, fully uh, thumbs up to the, you know, a big project that inspires, uh, you know, young engineers or, or whoever. Yeah, I'll just chime in on that one. We have six uh, interns this summer, uh, and I got over um, two dozen resumes for those, uh, and I was expecting to hire one or two, and we ended up hiring six interns to work on our uh, low carbon initiatives this summer. So there is just huge, I think, untapped asset in, um, in, in excitement around the next generation that wants to be part of this, and I think that's a, that is an asset. Those human assets are something that we don't talk about enough. Uh, Pradeep, I know you wanted to get on in this conversation, so I, go ahead. I just wanted to say that there's an existing talent pool already that need, need, needs to be tapped in. And some of this we see happening right now, you know, the Greentown Labs uh, and uh, and the ION coming up. I mean, these are going to, and, and we have Rice uh, Accelerator. So these are going to be key in, you know, developing technologies and, you know, the young minds uh, bringing in new perspectives. That said, one more thing that that that's not been part of this conversation, and I'd like to stir the honest nest again here by saying that the public perception of hydrogen, right? That is one thing that needs to change. Mm -hmm. uh, even a large part of population, when people think about hydrogen, they think about the Hindenburg disaster, right? And and that kind of throws people off the conversation. How, how am I going to sit on in a car with a hydrogen tank under, under me, right? Uh, is it going to blow up? So these kind of things needs to be, uh, you know, there's, there's need to be an education campaign as well. Uh, hydrogen's been around. We have sent people to, uh, you know, moon with, with, uh, with the power of hydrogen, right? We have handled hydrogen for almost, you know, 50 years now, uh, and we know how to do it uh, safely. Uh, and so that that's one thing that I think that needs to uh, be brought up. The other thing is in terms of policy, right? I mean, I, there are two uh, clean uh, uh, hydrogen bills in Congress right now, uh, mostly around the, the production tax credits, right? And so uh, producer tax credits. So uh, you will see a lot of this happening and that, that uh, along with the public education, uh, industry collaboration, uh, startup incubation, that's, that's the key uh, uh, you know, way forward, right? So um, I think uh, all those things have to, to be there and we see that as happening. It's not like it's not happening. And so that to answer the question on threats, uh, we are not lagging behind. We have started uh, taking steps and we are moving in the right direction. So I'm, I'm the glass half full guy. Good. <laughs> it's happening. <laughs> Good. So uh, other perspectives on what needs to happen? Anyone else want to get in on that well, one? Well, I would add real quick, uh, Pradeep mentioned public education, but I think it's our government, the legislators, the guys are making the rules at, and, and putting in the policies, right? The work we're doing on our project, right? I think the work, you know, the work that you've done, Brett, uh, with the Center for Houston's Future, right? That work needs to be put in front of those legislators, people who will make those policies, because uh, you know, as Pradeep said, a lot of them probably don't even know what to think when they hear hydrogen, right? So uh, just piggybacking on, on what he said. Well, that gets me to my next question. And, um, you know, we talked a lot about uh, cross-cutting initiatives at the conference and policies and training and workforce infrastructure are examples of those. And, and Mike, just to come back to you, you mentioned, I think, in passing the CRES initiative as a, a shining example, I think, of where Texas did come together uh, to be a leader. Um, in renewables, and that really uh, took a lot of effort. So, um, what what do you see as the um, the crez of hydrogen? Um, and maybe Katie suggested one. When maybe we need a big uh, sort of um, re, you know re reliability project. I don't know. Uh, just uh, throw this open. What are some of the things that need to happen in terms of uh, these cross cutting initiatives? I Mike, mean, go ahead. Very, yeah, very much a parallel to crez. Maybe it's hydrogen pipelines from West Texas to Houston, right? That support the export of green hydrogen, right? Or ultra low CI hydrogen. That it would be very akin to the to, to CRES, right? And putting in the um, the competitive energy, uh, renewable energy zones and, and building upon those transmission lines. Um, you know, we've actually looked at that a little bit and it's actually more affordable and you can ship more energy via the pipeline than you can transmission lines. Uh, so there, there, it seems to make a lot of sense. And, you know, if that type of project were to take place, it's probably going to have a lot of the similar benefits leading to jobs in the area. Maybe there's additional value for landowners and so forth. 
So uh, it could be a, a lot of great things, uh, you know, from a policy such as that. Now, you know, where uh, beyond West Texas into Houston, what a similar type credit policy could be, I guess maybe it's, um, you know, maybe it's additional pipelines that are coming out of Houston and into the Texas Triangle to support trucking or something, right? So. Katie, any thoughts on that? Maybe that's your big uh, big project that you're looking for. What are some of the policies or some of the other cross-cutting things that you see that need to happen here? I think with, I'm going to go back to, for me, hydrogen and CCUS are linked for Houston. And a lot of people still see a lot of obstacles for CCUS at large scale. Like for offshore, um, we have a lot of questions on what does injection look like? for class six wells. There are a lot of questions that we have from a regulatory and policy standpoint, and that helps make our hydrogen lower carbon. And then to Mike, and I think it was Brian actually said earlier too, you know, talking about West Texas, anyone that's been out there, you see all the wind tur turbines are still a good portion of the time. So if we can utilize storage and new pipelines to help utilize the resources that we as Texas have, because we're already number one for wind. So how can we really spread that gap and just keep dominating in that space and actually put it to good use? I think a lot of that is around new pipeline projects, new storage projects, um, and then continuing to push for blue on this side as well. Good. So uh, maybe over to Nevo, uh, cross-cutting initiatives, what are some of the things that need to, to happen uh, to make this a reality, do you think? Yeah, so I, I'll go back to kind of my first set of comments, but I think Houston should pull together a net zero industrial cluster. And I say that like it's easy and it's not, right? The first we'll take is partnerships. So you get a greater Houston area partnership, you pull in the city, you pull in the, you know, in Midtown, you guys have a great innovation district standing up. So you pull in groups from there, you pull in large corporations, right? You set those partnerships, you set your common net zero goal, you identify what are the policy frameworks we need support in to do that? And then you go and you talk about those things. What is the financing we need? And maybe we could be innovative in financing to enable it. And the last piece are what are the technologies? Hydrogen is a key piece and CCS and electrification and batteries and long duration energy storage beyond that, right? So you pull in from different technologies and now you've created the project that Katie's talking about in a very ecosystem type of approach where one company's waste is another company's fuel and there's a symbiosis of magic in Houston. So um, I don't know, that's what I think. I th yes, and Michael's clapping. You can't see him, but uh, I can. Uh, and he's clapping and so is Katie. So let's, let's go with that. Okay, well, that very exciting. <laughs> Brian, you want to add to that or uh, can you build on that anymore? Or what do you think? All, all I want to say is let's, let's, let's uh, bring Neva to Houston. Uh, I think uh, she, she's she's going to be a great cheerleader. We need a we need her need her on our team here. So, um, but no, no. I, I think I think pretty much everything's been said that that uh, that needs to be said. I, I, as a technology guy, I, I will say, I guess one other thing. Okay, I've always got something else to say. So, the in, in my part of my checkered past, I was a regulatory manager at one of the big energy companies, and there are a lot of subtle obstacles that we don't talk about very much for introducing hydrogen into the larger infrastructure. And, come, and because there's not a direct connection between um, hydrogen and profits, a lot of the uh, existing players that, that lobby our legislators and so on don't really focus on lowering these subtle obstacles. Things like uh, pipeline tariffs, uh, regulatory rules, or open access for pipelines, things of that nature that that can lead to, to again, greater um, or easier uh, uh, transport of hydrogen or, or um, uh, better price transparency, things of that nature. Those are, those are um, that's an area that's, again, it's, it's, it's hard to put your head around, but it's an area that's very, very important to grow this industry. Whether we're talking about just hydrogen or CO2 sequestration, which goes hand in hand with, with blue hydrogen, um, we need to begin to figure out what these regulatory barriers are and start dismantling them. Um, that's going to be a very important, but boring, you know, eye glazingly boring part of what 
needs to happen to, to make this industry move forward. Okay. Well, you guys have uh, given me a lot of great thoughts and maybe some things to do uh, for the next, I guess, maybe oh, 10 years um, as we start to try to build this from uh, collaboration to research, uh, the coming up with that, um, that big, audacious, hairy goal. We need our moonshot in Houston uh, to make this all happen. So I really want to thank uh, this panel. It was a really great discussion. Uh, I think I learned a lot uh, from, from all of you, and I really do, in the spirit of collaboration, look forward to working with all of you uh, to make this happen. Uh, so thank you for being here, and thanks for being part of this. And uh, why don't we take a quick break, and just to finish up today's uh, session, uh, we'll have two exciting speakers, Lizzie Fletcher and Jigger Shaw. So uh, we'll be back in a few minutes.